have a challenge for you guys. I have to be honest with you, the last service spoiled me. They were amazing. They were like engaged. And so I need you to stay engaged with me because I've had five shots of espresso. And so I need people that can listen quick and lean in and be strong. And I heard you guys could do that. Is that right? Okay, we love your pastors, Greg and Tamara. They are amazing people. And I believe that this church's destiny is far greater than her history. I believe that you are part of that. And I understand you guys are getting ready to fast. Is that true? Okay, and some of you are like, I can't fast food. I'm pregnant or I'm breastfeeding. Well, you can fast TV. Or you can fast that friend who's always telling you stuff that you shouldn't be hearing about. Or, God forbid, you could fast Facebook and put your face in the book. Okay, so you could shift some stuff. For just just a couple days, you could do that because, see, a diet changes the way you look, but a fast changes the way you see. And if you want to cross over, you got to get a different perspective. You've got to see where you are going instead of seeing where you have been. And so I'm excited about being here, and I'm going to actually show you what my home world dynamic looks like. I am a mother of men, and so I travel and speak just for my sanity's sake, to women. My estrogen levels are so low right now that I am not only growing a beard, I am possibly growing a mustache. And so I need more daughter-in-laws in my life. I have one daughter-in-law right now. I have one pending. I need two more. Okay, so that son on my far right is Austin Michael. He is 26. He is single. That needs to change. Then next to him is my youngest son, Arden, who is 21. He will actually be here with John on Wednesday. Loves God with all this. He's actually preaching Tuesday. Isn't that awesome? He's down at Hillsong College. He's 21. We're going to leave him alone for a while. But just kind of put him on your radar. Then there is my husband of 33 years, John Bevere, favorite preacher. My son, Alec, who is engaged Thank God to a Hispanic girl. We were getting way too white. We needed a little bit of color, a little bit of spice in our life. And then my oldest son, Addison, who is all of the good and none of the bad of John and I. We need to pray that with our first child. And then I need to show you my grandson, Asher. Now, Asher is our first grandchild. He is awesome. I need to point out two things in this picture. Number one, the dead deer. Do you see the dead deer? Okay, that is a 16-point buck, 14 points, two-point drop time. Okay, I shot it. I shot it. It lives in my house as a constant reminder to John that if there is ever adultery, there will not be a scandal. There will be a sniper attack. Okay, so dropped it with one shot. The other thing I want to point out is the tattoo. Okay, so I went around the world in September. I went from Denver to Tokyo, Tokyo to Jakarta, Jakarta to Dubai, Dubai to Johannesburg, and then came back home. And if you're going to be gone that long as a grandmother, you need to come back with tattoos. And so I put a tattoo on my grandson, and he looks kind of sad in this picture because I had just told him it wasn't permanent. He was so upset. He was like... I wish it was forever. And I said, gee, mama cannot ink you. But I need to let you guys know something that John will try to tell you that he is the favorite. It is a lie from the pit of hell. He is not the favorite. I am the favorite. Our house is called gee, mama's house. It's not even, John is even mentioned in the assignment of our house. Okay. He's never changed a diaper in the grandchildren. So, you know, he can't really be a friend. Okay. And then we have Sophia. Sophia is the first female born to my family in more than 50 years. We were, I was the last, we were so excited about Sophia. We thought a gentle breeze was coming in to bless us. I have to, yeah, you understand what I'm ready to say. I have to be honest with you. She is fiercer than all of the boys put together. Uh, She needs Jesus. And, uh, (laughs) I think, I think I got her saved. I talked to her about separation uh, from God, and she did say, oh, yeah, I know about separation because Marshall and Asher were fighting, and they had to be separated. I was like, that's kind of part of what I'm saying to you. So I prayed with her last week. So in Jesus' name, Sophia, 
is saved. Praise the Lord. And then we've got Lizzie. And Lizzie is 19 months. She only started walking a month ago because she is so fat that she could not get her thighs centered over her feet. Uh, her feet are about this big. Her thighs are about the same size as mine. We are not sure if she was trying to keep her center of gravity low to escape. Sophia Asher tends to be very nurturing. Sophia tends to drag people. I'm going to show a picture of all three of them together, and it will explain what is going on here. <laughs> Sophia can scream louder than anybody else on the face of the earth. Asher, we have to say, stop kissing, stop kissing. Give the baby breathing space. Sophia, we have to say, let her go. Let her go. Sophia, put her down. So anyway, that is kind of my world. And I have another picture for you. I'm going to show you a picture of something called the tough mutter. Any people here know what the tough mutter is? Okay, awesome. Okay, it is a ridiculous obstacle course race for people that want to be electrocuted, people that want to swim in ice cold water. It took place in Colorado in this particular one, and it was running uh, 10 miles at 12,000 feet above sea level, which a lot of people just fall when that happens. And that is my son right there, 10612. And he and his friends won the Tough Mudder. Okay, I was like super excited about that. I was like, okay, I made that possible. I genetically produced you. I mean, come on, my husband golfs. I'm the one that hunts, skis, and surfs and had a motorcycle, a ninja. I'm like, I gave you the ability to win the Tough Mudder because I am a tough mother. And so I have taken this on as my assignment that I could have won that, but chose to pass it on to my children. <laughs> he also ran another race in 2014 called the Spartan Race. There it is. And I was flying home from London. I had done Hillsong Women's Conference. I had done two weeks in Sydney and one week in Cape Town and one week in London. And he picked me up. He still had dirt in his ears. He came like straight off the thing. And I was like, did we win the Spartan race? And he was like, no, mom, we, we didn't win this one. He said, because I learned something. It's actually more fun helping other people over obstacles than it is crossing the finish line alone. And if you are going to be crossing, then you need to understand your job is to make sure as many people are part of that crossing. And so I'm going to, as a grandmother, help you over some obstacles. Because as a woman who is 55, there are a lot of things that I have learned the hard way. That there is no reason for you to relearn the hard way. Because we need a generation that takes the lessons of the other generations and builds on them instead of making the same mistakes over and over and over again. So, I am going to share with you one of my favorite quotes. It's by A.W. Tozier. It says, we, that means all of us, not just pastors, not just men, not just women, not just old, not just young. We, collectively, can be in our day what the heroes of faith were in their day. But remember, at the time, they didn't know they were heroes. I believe that I am standing in the company of a gathering of heroes unaware. I think you don't understand what is on your life or what has been entrusted to you, so I'm going to give you a visual. You have been entrusted with an invisible, invincible, eternal weapon. It is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And it is time we stop just merely studying the word, reading the word, and begin to live the word of God. Because it's the word of God that's made flesh that has power in our life. And we have not been entrusted with this word to beat people up. I am so tired of the church being known for what it is against. We need to be known for what we are for. We use the word of God to set captives free. 
Having said that, we don't back down from truth. We declare it boldly. And I get it right now. If you declare the word of God boldly, people say you are hating. People say that you are judging. But it is a lie. Matthew 10, 26, verses 28, verse 26, 28 says, don't be intimidated. He knew that we'd live in a day and age where the enemy would try to intimidate us. Eventually, everything is going to be out in the open. And everyone will know how things really are. So don't hesitate to go public now. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There is nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Save your fear for God who holds your entire life, body and soul in his hands. We are a people chosen for this time. And if you do not speak the word of God, if you do not speak truth, then who will? Come on, we need to be a people that do not draw back. To illustrate some of this, I'm going to tell you a completely carnal story. Do not write me letters. Do not write your pastor's letters. I'm just setting something up so you'll remember it. I traveled home on my 50th birthday from Great Britain. It felt like the longest day ever. When you start in that time zone and you keep going to Colorado, it just keeps going and going and going. When I landed in Chicago, I called my husband and I said, if you are even thinking of throwing a surprise birthday party for me, I will divorce you. I don't want to have anybody in my house that I did not give birth to. He said, you're safe. Just come on home. So I came home. I brushed my teeth. I just dove into the bed. And the next morning I woke up and one of my sons was standing in my room. He said, mom, will you take me to the doctor? Well, I, I thought it was a great idea because I'm half Sicilian, which means I want, thank you, which means I want everything half price. And so if I could take my son to the doctor, then I felt like I could get something that I thought was a spider bite on my back looked at by the doctor at the same time. So we showed up at the doctor's and while the doctor was looking at my son's eyes, I began to show him what I thought was a spider bite on my back. And he explained to me, that's not a spider bite. That is shingles. He said, you are grounded. You have pushed yourself too far. Now, a lot of people would be happy to hear that, but I was not happy to hear that. That tough mutter thing makes me think I can do whatever I want to do, and I don't like to hear that I have limits, so I wasn't going to tell my husband, but my son told on me. And so my husband said, that's it. You're grounded for the next two weeks. You live in your pajamas. And I was so sad. I was moping. I was walking around the house when all of a sudden I discovered I was not alone. I was home with my youngest son. We made eye contact, and he patted the sofa next to him. I came running over, threw my arms up around Arden. Now, you need to understand why this would be so exciting for me. Because, see, Arden is my youngest, which means he had repeatedly asked me to marry him. <laughs> youngest son also means he would cuddle me during movies. Youngest son also meant when the three older boys slept on the floor in my room, Arden slept in my bed, and the first thing he would say when he woke up was, I didn't kick you, did I? That was until the, he doesn't do it anymore. That was until the three older sons shamed him out of the practice. They're like, stop asking mom to marry you. That is gross. She is old. She is married to dad. Stop cuddling her during movies. Put the pillow between the two of you. Be a man. But they weren't home that night arms around Arden. I turn around and look at the television and I say, for the love of Jesus, Arden, what are we watching? He said, we are watching Terminator 1. Now, I don't know if you've seen Terminator. It is not a Christian movie. We did watch the edited version on TV, but it's okay if you didn't see it. It just keeps coming back over and over and over and over again. They keep remaking it. I think you can see the newest version this year. But basically, it is the story of Sarah Connor. She is a moped riding waitress. And every single day, she goes to Marie Callender's and waits on tables. And every single night, she goes home and waits by the phone, hoping some blind date is going to work out for her. That is until Arnold Schwarzenegger, the former governor of California, and Maria Shriver's ex-husband comes back from the future. And he has one goal in mind, and that is to assassinate everyone with the name Sarah Connor. And it doesn't look like he will fail. 
because he has in his possession the height of 80s data, which is a page torn out of the yellow book, and he is crossing them off one by one. When Sarah finds out she might be at risk, she did what a lot of us did in the 80s. She goes out to a bar. She's going to get lost in a crowd. But Arnold is relentless, and he finds her there. Guns firing, people dying, bad dancing, stopping. (laughs) But in the midst of this assassination attempt, her protector from the future shows up. And he grabs a hold of Sarah, and he says... If you want to live, come with me. You might have heard this on the Lego movie. If you want to not die, come with me. Sarah's like, I want to not die. So she leaves with this complete stranger. And in the midst of running from the Terminator and wild chases and car wrecks and, you know, guns, her protector from the future is trying to tell her who she is. He says, in the future, you're a hero. In the future, we fight with the strategies you recorded for us. In the future, your son is our general. Sarah's like, you need to stop right now. This is a horrible case of mistaken identity. I do not even have a boyfriend, let alone a son. But he continues to press her until she has a meltdown. And if you could see Sarah's hair, you would understand why. She yells, but I haven't done anything. And that is when her protector from the future says, no, but you will. And it was in that moment that I realized the enemy of our souls often knows who we are. Long before we wake up and realize who we are, which just means it stands to reason that the attacks on your life up until today have much more to do with who you might be in the future than who you have been in the past. And the enemy will always get you to look at your past to negate your future. But I'm going to challenge you today to look at your past and say, what is so terrifying about me that the enemy is working so hard to shut me down and shut me up and throw your shoulders back and say, I am going to find out what I am created to be and created to do. You need to know the two things that Sarah realized. Number one, you're a target. I don't know if we tell you that here at this church during altar calls. Maybe you felt them painting a bullseye on your back. But the moment that you come down to become a Christian, you are anointed by God's Spirit. And when you are anointed by God's Spirit, you are noted by the enemy. If you're a Christian, you're a target. I'm sorry, you don't really have a choice about that. But Christian does not mean a nice person who passes out tracts instead of candy on Halloween. Christian means that the same spirit that raised Christ from the grave has quickened your mortal body. And you need to understand what you have been entrusted with and why, why you are here. Number one, target. Number two, you have a choice about. You just might be a hero. But then again, you might not be a hero. You might choose to be a prisoner of war rather than a warrior. But there is no middle ground. There is no neutral territory. And I would rather intentionally choose than have it chosen for me. And so to equip you for what I believe is actually your most astounding, exciting days. Not the easiest, but actually the days that you were created for. I'm going to preach to you this morning out of my collection of least favorite scriptures. And these are found in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. It opens up with, consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. 
Let it do its work so you can become mature, well-developed, and not deficient in any way. If you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. You'll get his help and won't be condescended to when you ask for it. Ask boldly, believingly, without a second thought. People who worry their prayers are like wind-whipped waves. Don't think you'll get anything from the master that way. Adrift at sea, keeping all your options open. That's a massive amount of scripture, so I'm going to break it down for you. It opens up with, consider it a sheer gift, friends. When tests and challenges come at you from all sides. Another version has the audacity to say, count it pure joy, not mixed with any sorrow. I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't like that scripture. Let's say I go home tomorrow, and I land in Colorado Springs, and I turn my phone on, and my cell phone starts blowing up with bad news. And the last time I remember being happy was here at Crossing. And so I call Pastor Greg and Pastor Tamara, and I say, oh my gosh, you cannot believe what has happened since I was at Crossing. I want to come back. My world is falling apart. And before I can finish telling my story, Pastor Greg says, what a gift. We are so happy for you, Lisa. Tamara, will you lead the three of us in song? You know what I'm going to do at that point? I'm going to hang up on Pastor Greg and Pastor Tamara, and I'm going to call my Greek friend, Christine Kane. Because her being Greek and me being Sicilian means we have an arrangement. I am angry on behalf of Christine, and Christine is angry on behalf of me. That way neither of us sin. But the truth is we might not be looking at this correctly because our God considers ambushes without any means of escape to be an opportunity to show himself strong. It goes on to say, you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. I know that. I don't like who I am under pressure. I like who I am at the spa. I like who I am when I drink coffee in the morning. I like who I am in the pulpit. But that's not where my faith life is forced in the open. My faith life is forced in the open under pressure. In Colorado, we have one month on record without a blizzard. It is called July. That means that if I want to grow certain things, I have to go to Home Depot. And I buy those bulbs, and I put them in my refrigerator drawer, and I tell them a lie. I say, rest well, my friends. You are having a mild winter when it's possibly three feet of snow outside. And then when it should be spring, but we still have blizzards, I put them on the windowsill of my laundry room that faces south. And they begin to grow. And then when I know the last danger of a killing frost is gone, I put them outside and they bloom. It's a process called forcing them. And God is creating environments and atmospheres for you to learn how to bloom under pressure. We should do well under pressure. When the world caves, we're supposed to actually rise up. Sorry about me spitting. Okay, and it says, so don't try to get out of anything prematurely. What does that tell me? That tells me you can opt out. That tells me that you can say, I, I'm sorry, this is too hard for me. I don't want to go to a church that actually is asking me to fast, asking me to tithe, asking me to come in time for worship. I, I don't want a church that's asking me to participate. I come to church to find out what God is going to do for me. Well, you can do that. You can go to another church that says we're not going to require anything of you. But you know what? You have to take a retest. And the retests are always more difficult. There are so many things you win in life by just staying the course Having done all to stand, stand therefore. I don't know what you're thinking about giving up on. I don't know what hope. I don't know what dream. I don't know what prayer that you think you've prayed for too long. Don't you dare back up. Don't you dare lay it down. Don't you dare be silent. You need to get louder. Having done all to stand, you stand therefore. The enemy will always attack you, the strongest right before you're getting ready to cross the threshold 
and to your promise. It says, if you don't know, it says, let it do its work so you can become mature, well-developed, and not deficient in any way. You know, for too long, the church has been deficient. For too long, the church has not been well-developed. Why? Because whenever we come under a pressure situation, we cave. It's time that we begin to bear up under the weight and the pressure that the world is putting on us. And we begin to lift up Jesus. And as we begin to lift up Jesus, we'll build strength. It says, if you don't know what you're doing, my Bible, I changed it. I added a word. I said, since I don't know what I'm doing. Most of the time, I don't even know where I am, let alone what I am doing. The truth is we are ending, we're starting in, into days where no one has been. No one has been. We can't look back to get an idea of where we're going. We can't look side to side. We're going to have to look up. We're going to have to say, God, what are you doing right now? I don't know what is going on. He's like, I'm so glad you're asking me to get involved. Since you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. Come on. We've come about to the end of what we can do in our human strength. We've come to an end of what our government's going to do for us. It's going to have to be thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He loves to help. You'll get his help and won't be condescended to. He's not going to say, can't you figure this out? He's going to say, thank you. I want to get involved in your life so that you can see the exceedingly abundantly above all. You can ask, hope, and pray and believe. Now, you're going to meet my husband, and my husband makes me look low energy. Okay, I'm planning on dying first just to sleep for six months before John comes up to heaven. My husband is so intense. And when he is, you know, he's like home for a couple of days, he like goes out and he like comes back with vision and a Moses face. And in 2011, he was doing that to me. And I was like, what is going on with this face? You're going to do something scary, aren't you? And he'd be like, I'm just pondering some stuff in my heart. I said, stop pondering. I need you to stop pondering and you need to debrief with your wife. And he was like, no, no, I'm just going to, I'm just going to share it when the council of four comes together. I don't even know why he calls it that because it's really only John that's the boss. And so when the council of four came together, John said, it has come into my heart to give away 250,000 books this year in Arabic, Farsi, Urdu, Chinese, Russian. I threw up in my mouth. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. The most number of books we've ever given away in a downturn economy was 60,000. How about we give away 100,000 books. How about we do something reasonable and doable? I watched my husband make a fist. I watched his fist come up. I watched it come down on the table. And he said, Lisa, my faith is attached to 250,000 books. At that point, we all stood up and said, 250. 250 is an awesome number. And then we joined hands and prayed a prayer that scared what was scared inside of us. If you are not praying the kind of prayers that scare you, what makes you think they're going to scare the enemy? Most Christians do not pray scary prayers. They pray scared prayers. Oh, God, keep us safe. Oh, God, it's so bad. Oh, God, I think our president is a Muslim. Oh, God, it's just dangerous out there. Okay, seriously? You do not allow your culture to form your prayers. You are supposed to pray the word of God. You are supposed to pull down words that have been forged in the fire of heaven and speak the word of God into your destiny, into your future. You're supposed to speak boldly and unafraid until what comes out of your mouth scares your ears. We're not supposed to pray safe prayers. We're supposed to pray faith prayers. Faith is a substance. Substance means it takes up room. It creates capacity when you begin to pray something that's bigger than what you can do, something inside of you opens up. You know what I'm talking about. Something jumps inside of you. And you think, what did I just pray? You prayed something that heaven can get involved in. 
That year, we did not give away 250,000 books. We gave away 270,711 books. And last year, we gave away 2.4 million individual resources to people that could not ever have them because of persecution or poverty. To date, we've given away 6.5 million resources. But you know what the sad thing is? My husband would have listened to me and done the 100,000. I bet we'd still be trying to figure out how to pay for it. God isn't interested in what you can do. He wants to get involved with you doing what he wants to release into the earth. That's why we ask boldly, believingly, without a second thought. People who worry their prayers are like wind-whipped waves. You know, when my boys were little, I discovered this principle. And I'd line up my boys in the, mor- in the night before they went to bed. And I would say to them, you are for signs and wonders and miracles. You are not for death and destruction. You are disciples taught of the Lord and great is your peace and undisturbed composure. All that is in Isaiah. My boys were like, what's composure? I'm like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. When you need it, it will be there for you. What was I doing? I was throwing the word of God into my boys' future to enlarge their pathways. See, as a parent, I've learned something. My children inherit one of two things, either God's promises or my fears. And so I wanted to create a world that wasn't shrinking, wasn't small, wasn't bound to what I had known or seen for my children. I wanted to create a wide open space For my boys, you can do the same thing. Ask boldly, believingly, without a second thought. People who worry their prayers, they're wind whipped. Everything you hear on the news, everything you see on TV, the songs that come out, leadership changes, they will end up driving your prayers. Don't think you'll get anything from the master that way. Adrift at sea, keeping all your options open. God does not watch over your worries to perform them. He watches over his word to perform it. So, you're going to have to make a decision. Are you going to begin to pray the word of God? Or are you going to live according to the word of men? Are you going to live according to the fear of God or the fear of man? Are you going to tremble at his word and believe that he who promised is faithful? Or are you going to think that everything that God says is conditioned to what a bunch of humans think? See, I'm just going to be crazy enough to believe that God is true and that the man is a liar. So I want to do something with you. I want you to stand to your feet. And I'm going to pray a grandmother prayer over you. I'm going to pray over you what I have prayed over my children for years. Lift up your hands. See, I believe in the last days We do it together, the sons and the daughters, the old and the young, the signs and the wonders, and the visions and the dreams. So, Father, I thank you that these are a people who will see up close what other generations only saw in the distance. Father, I thank you that they're going to speak out loud what other generations only dared to whisper. Father, I thank you that they'll lay hold of with their hands, what we only handled in prayer. I thank you they're for signs and wonders and miracles, and they are not for death and destruction. I thank you that they are disciples taught of the Lord, and great is their peace. And Father, I thank you that as they go into this season of fasting, you open their eyes to see, you open their ears to hear, you open their heart to believe, And Father, dreams that were dead, you quicken them and give them back life in Jesus' name. And everybody that agrees, say amen Amen and amen. I don't like how the book of James opens, but I like how it closes. It says, so let God work his will in you. Say a loud no to the devil and watch him flee. Say a quiet yes to God, and he'll be there in no time. He says, purify your inner life. Quit.
playing the field because we're in a season of harvest. And in harvest, we don't play the field. We work it. You are laborers of God, walking in a day and a time, unrivaled by any other day and a time. You have been entrusted with the word of God. Have it in your life. Become fluent in its language. And you will watch it transform everything that you now see as a reality. That thy kingdom come and thy will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.